Francis Bacon is widely held to be the greatest living painter in the world. He's just been given the exceptional honour of a second major retrospective at the Tate Gallery in London. Bacon was born in Dublin in 1909, although both his parents were English. His father was a breeder and trainer of racehorses. At the outbreak of the First World War, the family moved to London, where Bacon's father worked in the war office. For the rest of his childhood, the family moved back and forth between Dublin and London. Bacon never had a normal schooling. He suffered from asthma and was tutored privately. In 1925, at the age of 16, Bacon left home. He lived in London for a while, then travelled in Europe. He stayed in Berlin at the height of its decadent period. From Berlin he moved to Paris, where he visited an exhibition of work by Picasso. He decided to become a painter himself, but when he went back to London, he was known initially as an interior designer. In the early 30s, he turned more to painting, and Herbert Reed featured his Crucifixion 1933 in the influential book, Art Now. However, his first one-man show was not a success. Discouraged, he began to paint less and started to gamble. In 1936, Bacon offered some of his work to the International Surrealist Exhibition. It was rejected as being not sufficiently surreal. In the early 40s, Bacon destroyed nearly all his earlier paintings. In April 1945, the art world was shocked by the painting which he now regards as his first serious work, three studies for figures at the base of the crucifixion. In your earlier paintings, you seem to concentrate mostly on the head and the mouth. Can you remember painting that in 1949? Yes, I can. And I had always thought that I would be able to make the mouth with all the beauty of the money landscape, but I know it didn't succeed in doing so. Why do you think that is? What? Why do you think you didn't succeed? Well, I don't think I did. I think it should all be much more colour. I should have got more of the interior of the mouth with all the beautiful colours of the interior of the mouth, but I just didn't happen to get it. Well, that's one of the great paintings of the world, of course. <clears throat> yeah, Velasquez is one of the very great paintings of the world, I think. Well, I was very obsessed by that Velasquez, and, of course, I made a great mistake, and I tried to do these paintings afterwards of the Pope screaming, but I don't think they ever came off. Really? I never got the colour, and I never got the screen vibrant enough to be what I really wanted at all. 
Well, that is just a woman with a... Well, I didn't... I couldn't put an... They said, well, why did you put a hypodermic syringe? Well, I said, I want something to nail it to the bed. I couldn't put a nail in, so I thought a syringe was just as good. He said, were you trying to suggest a drug addict? I said, not at all. Let's put a syringe in. You've talked about deforming and reforming reality in your paintings. Would this be an example of it with regard to the body? I think it would. I don't think you've seen the human body quite like that. No. I would say this, there was some deformation, wouldn't you, in yeah. that? I do believe that um, today, or we could say modern man, wants a sensation really without the boredom of its conveyance, or the cut down of conveyance as far as possible, so that you just give over the sensation. But do you see any boredom in that at all, of the conveyance? I think that's a very beautiful painting, and of course it does convey this very beautiful woman lying on the bed, but um, it's not quite... I... You see, you once had that, once had that marvellous things to look back on, whereas in when I do the things, I really always try to make concentrations yes. of, uh, you know, concentrations of images. Well, that was a disaster. We could turn that disaster off, I should think. Why do you think it's a disaster? Well, I just don't. I just think it just doesn't work. Is it, can you tell us why you think it doesn't work? Well, I don't think, I don't think formally it works. I don't think that bit of rubbish I put in the foreground works. I don't think anything about it works. It, the, the, the layout is rather good, but it just the rest of it I don't like at all. Or should I just burn it? What do you think about the idea of doing away with story, with story and representation altogether, a la Jackson Pollock? I've never really cared for, for Jackson Pollock, and of course, I said, as he's a great hero in America, I said the most terrible thing. When they, some American cow asked me what I thought about them, she was, she was, um, she was working for something, and I said, well, I think to me they look like bits of old lace. And uh, that went down very badly, I'm afraid, so I've never been liked in America since. Do you find any qualities as in Rothko, then? No, I, that is something that's always escaped me. Rothko completely escaped me. I mean, I always used to think that abstract paintings might at least bring you the most lovely, vibrant colours, but they... You know, they've got a room of them here. If you want to be really depressed for the rest of the day, you'll go into that room. I suppose you could say that's a quality. It's just that I hate that dirty maroon colour he's used in those things. And if I wanted really to be depressed, I'd go in for a few hours into that Rothko room to, to look at maroon. But I could go and look at a, at a yard of maroon on a, that they could roll out for me. It'd be just the same. I think that the most dreary paintings that ever been made. That was a painting that Van Gogh did, and he said about it, I've tried to express the idea that the cafe is a place where one can ruin oneself, run mad or commit a crime, he also said, although he was very, very fond of the painting, he said, it's one of the ugliest, ugliest paintings I've done. But I don't think it's ugly at all. I think it's an extremely beautiful painting. Of course, I don't understand what he's saying. Oh, there are cafe that people are ruining themselves by drinking themselves. If they want to drink themselves, why shouldn't they? And um, I just think one of the great inventions of it, for me at least, is the way he has done the lights. He's made, those, he's made the light turn around those bulbs, and that, in a way, adds enormously to the... Without that, that painting wouldn't have the same extraordinary, inten extraordinary intensity. Yes. When he says that's one of the ugliest paintings I've done, he was obviously aware at the time that people were saying his paintings were ugly. You ran into the same reaction early on in your career, didn't you? Well, I haven't... Made it. I've never shaken it off. In my case... But uh, he didn't shake it off, I don't think, in his life. No, not in his life, though. Either. But, what um, do you think of that reaction when people say your paintings are ugly? What do you think of that? Well, I'm very pleased they genuinely... Well, well, I'm genuinely pleased that those people don't like them. I mean, that would be the greatest condemnation if any of them liked them. So I'm much more pleased when they really hate them than when they like them. After all, it means that there may, might be something there if they really dislike them. Is this a form of a tribute to Van Gogh? Then? It's not a tribute. Um, <clears throat> I had to have an exhibition at the Hanover Gallery in 19, I think, 58, and I simply couldn't think of what I was going to do. I couldn't think of anything to do. And I suddenly thought, well, I'll make the whole exhibition about Van Gogh on the road to Tarascon. I don't think... 
I think this is one of the better ones, of the, or the best of the series. I don't think the whole series worked very well. I think this is the best of them. Can you remember what you felt when you made this painting? No, I don't feel anything when I do paintings at all. I have nothing to feel. I rather like the dog in this painting. I'm rather sorry that I put that image down in the front. I think perhaps it would have been better without it. I don't quite know. I like the dog. Sort of, it looks as if it's just lying there, as though it's had a really good run, and exhausted. And you can see it with his tongue out and everything else. And I like the foot in the I, I rather like that painting, I don't know why. And it's it's because it's really artificial. You could never have a you could never have a, a window just like that. Because I think the more artificial they are, after all, uh, <coughs> art is artifact. And the more artificial they are, the more, more artificial you can make them now, the better. And the more intense they will be. That figure in the foreground that slightly worries you now, did you put that in last? I put it in the end. I felt it wanted something, but I, feel I couldn't put a, an awful vase of tulips or something. And so I, um, I put this thing in. And, but I think I could have found something. I think I saw if I'd used one of the Greek statues or Egyptian statues, something it might have looked better. I don't really know. Egyptian statues are some of the things you like best of all, aren't they? I think this is the greatest art that's ever been done, actually. I think that the Egyptian things about 2,500 BC to 3,000 to 2,500 are the very greatest things that man has ever made, almost. And you see, they were made <coughs> by artisans. And of course, they generally had a religious reason behind them. Mm. And um, they were an attempt to defeat death, as all Egyptian art was. You may say they were always trying to defeat death by leaving images. But it won't make any difference. We'll just be dead, and uh, well, the image may live on. The Egyptians have lived on, for, and they seem more grand now than, I mean, or just as grand, I'm sure, as they ever looked. But um, well, there it is. I don't know. Why are you so attracted to painting the figure? The human well, figure. Because it's the most, to me, it's the most interesting thing to tell. I'm not. I'm not a landscape painter. And that thing coming through the, through the blue sky is, really comes from, from one of the fates, the Furies, in fact. You know, the Furies were all haunted with, by all our guilt and our um, everything. I'm not very much haunted with guilt these days. I don't care if I was, really. But you're very fond of Aeschylus, aren't you? Yes, I do, because it brings up... I read it because it brings up, the most, what, to me, exciting images. That's the reason I often read it. Because of the Furies and the... Well, not only of that, but the whole thing, the violence of, of Aeschylus, brings me up, brings up the, the, the images. Um, I mean, if you remember that wonderful translation of, of one of his lines, the reek of human blood smiles out at me. Well, what could be more amazing than that? That is, it immediately brings up the most astonishing images. Over the wide rolling earth we've ranged in flock. Hurdling the waves in wingless flight, and now we come, all hot pursuit. Outracing ships astern, and now he's here somewhere, cowering like a hare. The reek of human blood, it's laughter to my heart. Well, how long have you worked here? Well, I've been here for years, about 23 years or more. And uh, it's a kind of dump that nobody else would want, but I, I can work here. These are, these are my few abstract pi pictures here. And uh, because I use the walls and things just to test the colours out on. Yeah. And you like leaving all this stuff there? Well, I do. I just leave it there. I've even tried to clear it, clean it up. But... Um, I work much better in chaos. I couldn't work if it was a beautifully tidy studio. It would be absolutely impossible for me. Why do you think that is? I have no idea. Chaos, for me, breeds images. I generally try and work regularly because 
When uh, people talk about inspiration, I think uh, what is called inspiration only comes really from regular work. You didn't go to art school, did you? No, thank God. I would have been taught all those techniques which I don't want to know. I mean, I want to find my own technique, because if you're trying to do something... If you're trying to do something that's rather di uh, different and new, you can't use the old techniques which, um, which have already been used. You make your own technique. So how did you learn? I mean, how did you learn to make your own technique? By doing it? Trial and error. By, um, by just um, trying to do it. That's all. When you come to a canvas, have you an idea in your head as to what the finished image is going to be before you start? I have an, I have an overall image of what I want to do, but it's in the, in the working that it develops. And, um, you see, it's a very difficult problem, this now, as I'm a figurative painter, and um, um, I think that the... Um, that <clears throat> you, ca you can't any longer I make illustration because it's done so much better by the camera and by the cinema. So you have to really um, concentrate on making... Um, <clears throat> you have to... I thought about it very clearly this morning, wrote it down. <laughs> And I put it in my pocket. Now I can't remember what I was going to say. Can I use it? Yes, do. What I, what I thought of saying. And um, I, just, I just said, not illustration of reality, but to create images which are concentration of reality and a shorthand of sensation. Do you do drawings beforehand? No. You go straight onto the canvas? Yes. With the paint? Yes. What's the advantage of that? Well, because uh, I, I find if I drew it, and then I should just be making an illustration of the drawing. So it's so much better to immediately attack the canvas with the paint. What you like to do, I, I believe, is to somehow let your unconscious take over. Is that right? Well, that's, what, that's as far as one can, one would, I, I would like it to, because, um, after all, there's this deep sea, which we call the unconscious, which we know nothing about. We hope the mo I always hope the most wonderful images will emerge from it. At the same time, though, you believe in things being deeply ordered, don't you? Yes. So what... I, I, I believe in a deeply ordered chaos. And how do you in try... my work. How, when you're in front of the canvas, how do you try to arrive at that? What do you go through to try to arrive well, at that? Well, because the unconscious things that I try to... Uh, the, the, the images that I try to make, I still, th at the same time, want them to look very ordered. But you don't want to be in control of them. Well, this is, this is a great problem. In the very first place, when they come up, you're not in control of them. But when the image seems to emerge, then... <clears throat> to make it, you have to, you have to control it. But in control, you see, this is where with painting, it's, it's so difficult painting in oils, is <clears throat> you make an image and it's, it's changing all the time. And then it's, it's to do with your own instinct and sensibility, which, which turns it one way or another. That doesn't mean that I haven't got an overall idea of the type of thing that I would have liked to make, but I don't know how to make it. Yes. So you come in with an overall image which you don't want to define except through working towards it. Yeah, no, that's exactly how it is. Yes. That, uh, that's putting yourself at risk all the time, isn't it? Well, don't you think you have to? At least yes. as an artist you always have to. Yes. I mean, if otherwise you turn into an academician. Are you excited when you're painting or are you absorbed or are you depressed? or what? Do you have a particular mood or does it change? great deal. Well, of course, it changed like all our moods. Yeah. It changes, yes. But um, I have a very <clears throat> sort of optimistic nature, so I always think something's going to... good's going to turn up, or exciting. When you're actually following the oil, as you say, you make a brushstroke one way and that takes you one way, um, obviously that's quite dangerous and it might take you away that you 
find you don't like at all. What happens well, then? Well, very often that does happen and it um, just means destroying the canvas. You actually destroy the canvas? I do, generally, yes. Mm -hmm. You don't clean it and but reuse it or anything? I don't, because you can't... You see, I work on the opposite side, <clears throat> the unprimed side of the canvas, and that can't be cleaned. It, it just soaks right into the, into the texture of the canvas. Yes. Why do you use, the, as it were, the wrong side of the canvas? Well, I was living once down in Monte Carlo, and I'd lost all my money, and um, I had no canvases left. And so the, 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 the few I had, I just turned them. And I found that the, that the, that the um, what's called the, the wrong side, the unprimed side of the canvas, worked for me very, very much better. And so I've always used it. And that, it was just by chance that I had no money to buy canvases with. How, does it, how does it work better? I mean, what is better about it? Can you tell us? Yes. It holds. If you make a mark on it, you can rub it out on a, on a prime canvas and take it out. With that, it's there. It's indelibly made. I believe that sometimes you, well, you use a rag a lot on the canvas, you use brushes, uh, scrubbing brushes to scrub on, you actually throw paint sometimes at canvas. Can you talk about the relationship you have with the canvas in that very physical sense? Why is it important to you to sort of battle with it in that way? Because if you've ever seen somebody painting a wall, or if you've ever painted a wall yourself, you will see that the first mark that you make, and the, where the brush makes that mark, it has a vitality that when you've got the overall thing created, it's lost. And so you want that first mark, every that, mark to I be want... that first mark, as it were. Yes. What's to be gained by throwing paint literally at a canvas? Well, that was, I only did for, uh, for, for in a few paintings. I was sick of the look of them, I just threw a lot of paint on them. And, um, and they, t they turned out, well, they turned out, as they did. I quite liked them. <laughs> Is there any way it, that you finish a painting, or do you just leave it? I know when it's finished. I mean, my instinct tells me when it's finished. I can't do any more to it. Do you work continuously on the one painting, or the triptych, or do you, can you work on something, leave it for six months or even a year, and come back later, or do you clear what you're doing? No, practically everything I do, I work, I work very quickly, and I work on them, for instance, the triptychs, I can't. As you can see in a room like this, I couldn't work on them all together. Yes. So I just work on them and um, they, they happen to join up. Yes. You see, when I do these, uh, these paintings, I have had the, an overall idea of what I want to do, but um, as I'm always hoping the chance is going to work in my favour, I don't really know... I don't try to read my work. I don't really know what it means. It, I only know what it means to me uh, formally. So you're resisting telling a story. I mean, that is not telling a story. Very, very much so. I don't want to tell a story. I have no story to tell. I, I like the starkness of the image. I want it to give me a shock. Now, shock, you could say, is a form of expression. But what expression it is, I don't know. It's a visual shock. It's not, it's not a, a shock about... Um, it's not a, a shock that you could get from a story. It's, a sh it's just a, a, a visual shock. Would you resist the notion of describing that triptych as three portraits? You could call it three portraits if you want to. But um, I don't think of it in that way. And so what is it that you're presenting when you've finished? Nothing except what people want to read into it. Nothing. One of the striking things about your studio and uh, the place you live in are the number of books of photographs, the number of photographs on the wall, the number of photographs generally about the place. Why are you so attracted to photographs? Well, <clears throat> I've looked at every type of photograph. I mean, of wild animals, of, of movement, of, um, of every type of, of photograph. I, I, I don't really care what the photographs are, they just interest me. And every so often, certain photographs bring up images. I particularly liked a lot of these uh, photographs 
they've taken of wild animals. And I suppose there is another side to that too, that um, the, <clears throat> the movement of animals is um, the actual muscular movement probably has something to do w with the structure of many things that I would like to do. They, they are even stronger <clears throat> than the, pe the, the things that my bridge did on movement of both the human body and of animals. But I find that very often they are less interesting than the things that have been taken, as you said, just as it were uh, a momentary photograph. Is that because the fact is that is something to do with that specific thing is happening at that specific time and nothing else, and there's something about that instant inalienable fact that seems to you to be realer than anything else? Yes. There you put it very clearly. I think that's exactly what it is. That there it is. It, it is itself, and it's nothing else. And is there a sense in which you want your paintings to have a similar? Certainly. I would like impact. to have them. I would like my paintings to have the same immediate effect than, that you see of this photograph of, um, of the, a while of this animal after the kill. You refer to Mybridge, and uh, you've taken a great interest in his work. And of course, he experimented with taking photographs of movement almost 100 years ago now, didn't he? And so yes. we saw movement in a different way, frame by frame. What is his attraction to you? What do you get from Mybridge? The interest in Mybridge was what was the movement, but he also did <clears throat> people who were deformed and had all forms of deformity, which, which were interesting in themselves. Mm. Yes. But isn't there something in the Mybridge strips? You do see what appears to be a, a distorted set of bodies. Is that, is that something that sets you off, do you think? I think it is. Um, you, I mean, you'll find it in wrestling or boxing, anything I look at. I just like the movement and watch the movement of the, of the body. Every possible suggestion can come up from any type of photographs, pornographic photographs, anything you like. All those things can be, can be, be, be fascinating. You can see all kinds of interesting and exciting things mm. that you could perhaps lead, use. You were very actually taken at one stage with X-ray photographs and uh, some photographer had done... Well, I had a book on, um, right. uh, on, on positioning in radiography, That's right. That's which right. was... And there were very, very interesting things in that. And... Um, but it isn't... <clears throat> you see, for me, these things are just... Um, the, these things that are spread around the table are just like... <clears throat> like what is called, perhaps more, uh, more conventional art, is called having, having a model or subject matter. These are my models and my subject matter. I don't think I'm creative. I'm one of those people who has received a lot of luck and lots of chance. Because Why is chance more important than conscious intellect? Because conscious intelligence. I've made images that intellect would never make. There's a painting called Painting 1946, which somehow summarizes what you became known for. And uh, it was a painting of dead flesh, of meat. In that particular painting, I try to paint a bird falling into a <clears throat> field of, of grass. And then all the kind of marks I've made on the canvas suddenly suggested this painting, which had absolutely nothing to do with it. And how this painting came about, I, I can't tell you but it just happened to come about. And then I suddenly started to paint the meat and this great image, which is of a kind of dictator, and then the meat around him, it just happened to evolve, and it evolved very, very quickly. 
And how it happened, I don't know. It is one of the most unconscious paintings I've ever done. Why the meat? I mean, what attracted you to that? I um, used to think how marvellous these extraordinary carcasses are hanging really? in great butcher shops. Yes. Hanging from the wall, how amazing their colour was, how beautiful they looked. You say they're beautiful. A lot of people looking at your paintings think of them as um, horror images, images of shock, images of blood and dread, and not beautiful at all. Well, the thing is, what horror, what could I make to compete what, ha what goes on every single day? If you read the newspapers, if you look at television, if you know what's going on in the world, what could I do that competes with the horror that's going on? Except that I have tried to make images of it, and I have tried to recreate it and make not the horror, but I've tried to make images of realism. So when we look at your paintings, we're looking at the real world? Yes. I believe you are. After all, between birth and death, it's always been the same thing. There's always been this aspect, always, of... Um, not aspect, but it's what it is. It is the violence of life. I always think that they're images of, um, of sensation. After all, what is life but sensation? What we feel. What happens. What happens at the moment? What happens at the moment. Do you think there's anything that exists apart from the moment? No. I believe in nothing. We are born and we die and that's it. There's nothing else. So what do you do about it? I don't do anything about it. You I just it. I just drift. No, Francis, you try to paint it. I try to paint it, yes. But uh, you talk about my own life. But my own life is just a drifting life of going from bar to bar and drinking and that kind of thing. My impulse is my life. My impulse is that um, <clears throat> I'm an old man, but I'm profoundly optimistic about nothing. I've, I've How can you be opt optimistic about nothing, Francis? I can be. Why? I, just existing for a moment. Existing today makes me optimistic. Optimistic about what? Nothing. I'm optimistic about nothing. I'm just born with that kind of optimistic nature. I'm just optimistic about nothing. Why are you interested in the mouth in your painting? I can tell you why, because many years ago in Paris I bought a book which is on disease of the mouth. And then they were hand-illustrated hand things which were, which were very beautiful. And um, I love the mouth because it's rather like the mouth is rather like uh, 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 <clears throat> a turner. It's got this all these beautiful colours about yeah. it. It's got these lovely vibrations of colour between the tongue, the lips, the teeth, all those things. But, Francis, most of your mouths are black. My, I've never been able to make the really successful mouth. <laughs> Tell me about the history of painting flesh, Francis. Well, perhaps the, one of the greatest painters of, of female flesh was uh, Aring. I think he made the most marvellous images of them, and I think they are probably some of the greatest, um, the, um, in a curious way, the most sexual bodies that have been made of um, in, in painting. No man, probably, who didn't love women's flesh 
would be able to have painted as something as beautiful as a Bantuk. And do you find the same when you paint? I, ha I have different attitudes to life than to you, and uh, of course, but uh, my attitudes are different. Do you want to talk about that? I don't know not what Well, to I talk. can talk about it. Well, let's yes. talk about it. What attitudes do you have? I like men. Of course, male, male flesh is very interesting. It always attracts me, but um, that's, a, that's a different thing altogether. And what attracts you about men? Just like men. I like their brain, I like the quality of their flesh. You obviously love Michelangelo's men. I, I think the greatest things he ever did were the drawings, but I think they're the, most, the greatest drawings that exist. You said, I've read that you have said, that he gave the most uh, expansive, you use better words. You said the I'll most... I'll tell you what he, I said. I think he gave the greatest male voluptuous. Voluptuous, voluptuous, that's it, that's it. Yes. Voluptuous. To the male body. That's right, that's right. That's Any the, other man has ever done. Mm. Don't you think it's a and bit kind of... And is all we want, voluptuous. Yeah, yes, I know, it's wonderful, isn't it? Isn't it a lovely Absolutely word? Absolutely amazing. I actually, uh, we want to live in a state of voluptuousness. How right you do. are, whatever, yeah. whatever yeah. it is. And everything else is a falling away. Whatever it is, everything else... <laughs> Is a falling away. Is a falling away. That's right. You're not interested in fantasy, are you? No, not no. the least. Neither am I, not the slightest. I'm not interested in no. fantasy. No. I'm interested in reality. And what's reality? Reality Let's is what exists. Are you real? <laughs> to me, you're real. There you are. There you are, Melvin Bragg. You are absolutely real to me. There you are, flesh and blood, before me. How are you going to remake that? That's be a real... How are you going to make that in another art? Why That's... do you want to? That's the interesting question. Why do you want to? Why do you want to? Because I want to... to I want to be... You may say, why should you? But I want to be able to remake in another medium the reality of of an image that that that, that, that this excites me. Cheerio. Cheerio, Francis. <coughs> Why do you want to do that, Francis? Because I like doing it. That's because I'm a I, I happen to be a, a painter, and that's all. <laughs> Most afternoons, Bacon goes to the Colony Room, a drinking club in Soho. He's been going there since it was opened by Muriel Belcher in 1949. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ripon. Yeah, Ripon. I go to, um, to Oakley. Can I have a 50 pound note or two? Oh, I thought you and I were doing a bit of whoring together. She's giving him a really bad time, I think. Sorry, but I, think I have an idea he's one of those men who likes being given a bad time. You know, there's a lot of men like that. All we want is a room somewhere far away from the <laughs> I like seeing lots of people round, even if I don't know them. You watch the formation of their faces and their movements and all those kinds of things. It seems important to me. Is this a place you come to a lot here, the colony room? Yes, because um, I came in when it first opened. I had never known Muriel before, and we seemed to get on very well. And she said to me, Francis, I don't want you to work here, but just bring in people, or people that you know or you think would like to come in and that kind of thing, and I'll give you £10 a week and all your drinks free. So that was very, very helpful to me. 
You haven't got AIDS, have you? Oh, yeah. It was a place, the people, when Muriel was alive, very much so, where people came in and they were very free and they seemed to lose their inhibitions. Mm. It was as though it was like a sort of pool in which they forgot what their inhibitions were. And um, it, was a, it was very, very lively and amusing. I never use makeup. Keep your st keep your makeup to yourself, you old cow. <laughs> I'm not one of those made-up puffs. Well, you can. Very old-fashioned, you know. It's it's a very old-fashioned. It's a it's a very old-fashioned gesture. Because I wish it stayed a cowboy. My father was too mean to produce a man. Mine wasn't. He said to me many years ago, from the womb to the tomb. I think there's nothing better. But your life, in a sense, begins in this joint and ends in it, doesn't it? There was a wonderful club across the road, <clears throat> the Gargoyle, where people used to drift on to from here. And then in the bomb site out here, there was a wonderful, uh, there was a very nice place where about four o'clock in the morning you could go and have tea and, and uh, bacon sandwiches and that kind of thing. <laughs> and it was a kind of all night thing. It was, it, it was a lovely life. But that's dead now, it's, that's past. Um, I've got to do it myself. Do you know that? I've got to do much more money about that. Money, 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 money. I'm not here for the sake of work, I'm not here for the sake of my fucking health. I knew a lot of people who came in here, and, um, for instance, when I've done portraits, I've nearly always done portraits of people that I've known very well. And I used to know... <coughs> There's one star I've done, done of Isabel Rawthorne, for instance. Uh, she was a very, very beautiful woman, and I was very, very fond of her. And then all the people that I've painted, really, are people that I've either met in pubs or people I've known. But, you know, I generally paint them from memory, mm. and I have photographs of them which I refer to in, um, in the things, but I don't use the photographs really to paint them from. It's like a form of reference instead of having them there. I'd rather... I'd rather... And so that's the reason I always paint people that I know very well, because I know the formation of their face, and as in the portraits that I do, I'm always uh, hoping to... Um, to make an image of their heads, you know, more than just a literal portrait. There's no point in painting a, a portrait unless it looks like the person. But to remake it so that it turns back into an appearance of the persons but isn't an illustration of them is a real problem. Um, I did do a big, a big triptych of John, mm. which I think, um, I think is one of the... the <clears throat> the, the portraits that I've done that have really sort of rather worked and some of them he's fairly deformed but nevertheless it's, I think they, they look like him. <laughs> Why do you want to do three uh, portraits? I have no idea why, why that triptych series. I think it is one image, one image coming up against another, although they're not <clears throat> in, the, in these portraits of John, they are related because they are the same people, but it's a thing of just for some reason, it may have something to do with having watched film, a certain amount of films. It may be something like that that has given me the idea of doing triptychs. I don't quite know how it really started. Why would it come from films, though, rather than from, say, religious imagery, which is full of well, triptychs? It, well, it, it could have come from... <clears throat> it could have come from religious things, because <clears throat> I was very interested when I was young. I mean, it's a wonderful thing in the Grunewald, Isenheimer, crucifixion mm. and there are several crucifixions of his which are quite remarkable as one in Bern and um, it probably as you say it could easily have come from um, from these those <clears throat> those paintings 
but in the small ones, it's rather like, um, like those police photographs that you see, side face, full face, and then from, from left to right, full face, and then the <laughs> right to left, and so on. Yeah. They're rather like that. Did you make a conscious decision to start doing portraits? No, I don't really portraits? like doing portraits. I don't really like doing portraits. I just do them very occasionally. Mm. I've done a number of my of myself, which I, I, it's not because I like my face, because I hate it. But the thing is that I do it because there's nobody else around to do at that time. So that's the only reason. But I don't really like doing portraits. When you're painting yourself, is there any sense in which you're painting uh, an emotional condition. I mean, those portraits uh, after the death of George Dyer look extremely tragic. Well, I suppose, <clears throat> I suppose that what you do is coloured by the, by this kind of psychological state that you're in at certain times. But it would be an unconscious thing and not a conscious thing, because after all, I'm not at all an expressionist painting. I'm not trying to express anything. I'm not. I'm, I wasn't trying to express the sorrow about somebody committing suicide or something like that when I did those portraits of myself, but uh, perhaps it comes through without knowing it. In fact, there's a triptych of George Dyer, I think, which is, comes the nearest, almost the nearest you ever come to a story, doesn't it? It is, a st it is in fact, the nearest I've ever done to a story, because it <clears throat> that is, um, as you know, the triptych, that is how he was found. And uh, so, to, to that extent, it is a probably the nearest thing I've ever done to something which has a story. You said that one of the reasons you painted yourself was because your friends were dying around you like flies. Well, certainly a lot of people that, who, that I've known very well have died. They were generally heavy drinkers. And perhaps, I don't know if that, that contributed to it or not. Well, there it is. It's just, it's just the process of growing old. I mean, life becomes more of a desert, in a sense, around you. Do you think about death much, or...? I don't think much about it. I mean, I, I, I could say that, I, that, you, that, that you're always aware of it. I mean, you're always aware of it. It's just round the corner for you. But I don't think about it, because I, there's nothing to think about. When it comes, it's there. You've had it. But you have an acute sense of mortality, don't you? Well, don't you think everybody has? No, I don't think everybody does have. I mean, no. you described some time about when you were very young, just having a, a sense of the precariousness and the uh, precipitousness of, of life and not, never having left you. Well, I, well, no, I certainly have that very, very strongly. But then I think... Um, if you have a very strong feeling for life, I mean, its shadow, death, is always with you too. Mm. I mean, it's only another t turn of the coin. From the colony room, Bacon usually goes to a casino nearby in Soho. Gambling's always been an important part of his life, just as chance and accident play a major role in his painting. Seventeen black. I like the atmosphere of casinos. You talk to people at the bar, and there's the excitement of whether they're winning or not winning, and and the despair of people who've lost everything, and all that goes on in a very concentrated space. Yeah. I believe you generally play roulette, do you? I do. Why is that? Well, they say it's the silliest game you can play, and the odds are because the odds are more against you than all the others. But with the odds as they are, if you happen to hit hit the the numbers which I play on, um, sometimes um, sometimes your returns are very rapid. <laughs> I'm a heavy loser in the end. In fact, I think I must be the perfect compost for, um, for casinos because they must love somebody who comes in who's always losing. And I always remember many years ago there was a casino which doesn't exist now in Curzon Street. And I happened to have known the man 
and uh, I'd been in there once or twice, and I won or lost something. And he came up to me and he said, "Oh, you know," he said, "You know, France, you can run up the bill. You, know, I'll, you can you can pay us by check." Well, everything went wrong for me, and um, I I lost about nearly forty thousand. And I certainly hadn't got 40,000 in those days to pay, so it took me months and months and months to repay this man. Do you feel that, uh, that you put other parts of your life at risk, as you do when you're gambling? Do you think it's necessary for your, for your painting to... I to... don't think... I, don't, I think risk is too strong a word. I, I always think of risk as being people who take real risks, like risk their lives. I don't, I don't think gambling's a real risk. So this is a different sort of luck from the accident you're talking about in your painting? Yes, it is. Can yeah. you tell us what the distinction is, then? Well, <clears throat> the accident in painting is an accident you can make a... If the accident, as it were, something comes up, and you can use it, and you can develop it, whereas with gambling, every time the wheel spins, there isn't anything you can do with it. The one thing that comes compellingly from your work is that the experience that matters most to you is the experience of other human beings. Is that right? I mean, is that yes, the, the that is most so. important? Yes, yes, it is. Much the most important, yes. In the uh, paintings of our two people, they're almost always couplings. Are you interested in, in, in groups of people in any other relationship? Oh, certainly I am. I don't happen to, I don't happen to paint them, or perhaps be able to paint them. I p p partly the couplings are, are, or you call couplings of two people having sex, is that um, it's one of the things where generally they talk less than um, than in when <laughs> when they're talking to one another in conversation or something like that. I because I'm not really a conversational artist. I'm not. I don't do conversation pieces, and the coupling of them is a way really of cutting all that out. Because of whatever conversation they have, it may be fairly short. It could be said that they're all violent couplings. Would you agree with that? Well, I suppose most couplings are violent, aren't they, fairly? I mean, they're, they're more or less. But um, I suppose perhaps when you ejaculate, they are become more violent. And that's the nature of the violence in the painting? I think it probably is. But I don't really know. I mean, they're a couple, they're, they're, they're figure, figures coupled, but... Um, uh, I don't know how violent they really look to other people. Is there a sense in which you're representing these the bodies almost in their animal way? Well, of course, we are animals, aren't we? We are just anim part of animal life. But doesn't that lead you to think that life is it's not much, there's not much point in trying to improve life for other people in, in, and that sort of thing? Do you think there is? Well, I'm not a really do a do-gooder, and, and um, I suppose one should want to improve life and one should want to... Poo. I, ha I don't like to think of people... I don't want to think of people suffering, but then they do, because they, they breed at such a rate that they're bound to suffer. Are you interested, when you're painting, about whether the painting will talk in terms of pain or pleasure, or uh, do those sort of things interest you or even enter into what you're doing at all? Well, I hope they'll look like a reflection of reality or recreation of reality. But you could say that reality, nearly all reality, is pain. I mean, if, you, if one wants to read it that way. And when I say reality is pain, I, what I do feel, if you're going to catch anything that is really real in painting and making images, they will, when you say, I don't think they're painful, I think if anything is strong, people think it's painful. I don't think I've. I don't think my things I mean, have anything to do with pain. In fact, are you surprised your paintings have become so successful? Very. Yes. I am surprised. I never. I never thought they'd sell at all. I always thought I'd have to take some other kind of job. But that's luck. <laughs>